Okay, but in all seriousness, I'm gonna go over how to make clay at home, how to make your own clay body from scratch, my process, my journey so far to get to this point, and the pros and cons between buying your own clay versus making your own clay. This process takes a while, so I'm hoping to make a big batch today and then not make clay for, I don't know, a month or two. We'll see. Okay, so let's quickly go over what I have here in the garage to make your life easier. All my raw materials are over here. I have open bags of things I've used before that have cups in them for easy scooping. Okay. Got lots of buckets over here. Five gallon buckets for multiple batches of clay. Um, small buckets for mixing water or plasticizers, we'll go over that. Um, then like logistical tools, a couple of drills with a fan attachment, paper towels or shop towels. I got my mask in here. I've got spatulas, sponges, small cups, and I also have I also have some colorants. I'll be mixing some colored clay today as well from scratch versus having to wedge in all of the colored stains. Spray bottles, this helps a lot for cleaning off tools without touching them or adding more water little by little. Extra batteries for the drill and an extra bucket. Oh, duh, scale for weighing. Second to last, garden hose for water. And then my handy dandy notebook. This has my recipe in it. So. One thing that isn't listed a lot in clay recipes, it is sometimes, is a plasticizer, either bentonite or V-gum. Bentonite or V-gum, or a couple other ones, maybe macaloid, are plasticizers that help your clay be more plastic. Makes it more flexible, makes it more moldable, bendable, without cracking. Typically, a clay body that doesn't have a plasticizer in it is going to be pretty short, unless there are a lot of ball clays in it. So for a porcelain clay, you want it to stay white. If you use bentonite, there's iron in bentonite more than other plasticizers, so you'll have it be more gray, or you'll see some iron specks in there. If you want a plasticizer for a very white porcelain, like I'm doing, I have V-Gum. It's actually kind of expensive, I think it's like five or $10 a pound, but you only add about one or 2% per batch of clay, per dry materials. So for 100 pounds of dry clay, I'll add two pounds of V-Gum. I found that 3% is hard to get into the water. It kind of gels up almost too much. So 2% gives you enough plasticity, enough stretching on the wheel, enough bending for coils, enough bending for slabs, without gelling up, making it like waterlogged. Too much V-gum increases shrinkage and like it logs water. Pots take forever to dry. So I found 2% or less for my porcelain recipe is best. So yeah, I think, I think you get it. I try to add materials into a smaller bucket first. It's easier to balance on the scale. Then I pour that ingredient in a bigger bucket. 10 pounds of water. Bucket number two. And bucket number three. So 25 pounds of water for 100 pounds of dry clay. 25% will help the V-gum soak in. It'll be like a very wet plastic clay. I'll leave it out for a little bit. It's not a big deal. Two pounds of V-gum. Stir this in slowly. So those chunks you see in there, not a big deal. Work it a little bit more and those should dissolve. It helps doing this the day before, but as long as you do it really well, it's gonna be okay. This drill is pretty weak, so I'm gonna upgrade. I promise I'm not a rookie. That was kind of a rookie mistake. I forgot I have this really sweet mud mixer. This is for plaster and uh, like carpentry stuff. It's actually really great for doing this first step. I forgot. Like I said, with V-Gum, it absorbs water and so it's hard to get it absorbed into the water. This is already wet, so it doesn't matter if I have the mask on or not. So I thought it would be okay with 25% water, but it was just so gelled up. I add five more pounds. And so this is about 30% water. Check it out now, it's absorbing quite nicely. So this is good to go. And then spin this in some water to clean it. I'm gonna use this in about 15, 20 minutes, so I'm gonna leave it out in the sun to dry. So I'm not gonna talk so much about my specific recipe, but I'm making a very white porcelain, so I'm using china clay. It's a very white kaolin. Uh, it's called Grolig. You could use Tile 6, um, which is a little bit less white. You could use EPK, which is a little bit less white as well. 
more iron in it. Um, you wouldn't tell the difference unless you compared it with China clay side by side. There's one other Kalen out there. Oh, Halos tonight. I'm not exactly sure. It starts with an H. It's from New Zealand. It's the whitest Kalen in the world. Um, and it's also super expensive. So I'm just using China clay for this recipe. Nepheline cyanite, which is a very white flux as well. It's also good for cone 6 range. Custer feldspar is a typical flux for cone 10 clays. And then silica. That's all I have for this recipe. It's pretty simple. The goal for this clay when I started making it, this is probably version 3.0, was a very white, you know, cone 5, cone 6, translucent porcelain. Um, for coloring clays and letting the color show up as vivid and bright as possible, and also for throwing thin and getting some translucency. And I've tried to modify it over the last recipes, make it more, you know, user-friendly, kind of jack-of-all-trades, which is very difficult to do. Um, you know, best for casting, best for throwing, best for hand-building. Trying to get a clay I can use for everything. So this used to call for some CNC ball clay for a little bit of extra plasticity, and it used to call for some Gersley borate as well. Um, I found the CNC ball clay had bigger chunks in it, you know, more coarse particles. I didn't like that for my porcelain. And then the Gersley Bore, it's just expensive, super expensive. So I started with four recipes to get this recipe that I started working with. And then I did seven versions of that with a couple of different substitutions and changes in amounts. And now I have a recipe that I like for what I do. Ceramics is all about testing. Double check the recipe. Yep. It had been a while since making clay at home from scratch the last time, and so I thought I had a big enough bin, but I quickly realized I needed a bigger bin for all my dry materials. Okay, here's a little trick. Okay, so I need 25 pounds of silica. With a big batch, like I'm doing, 100 pounds, Here's a little trick if you're okay with a little bit of inaccuracy. I learned this in college from the great Tyler Lotz of Illinois State University. You flatten the bag on the ground, give it a few taps, cut it down the middle, lift it up. It should split it in half almost perfectly. There we go. About 25 and 25. Usually the bags aren't this tight. This is going to be kind of messy. Nothing in here is really harmful to you. It's all clay. But some stuff's heavier. And so to get it mixed up the first time, give it a good mix. Now, if I was mixing a slip or if I had a clay machine, it wouldn't be as important to mix dry materials ahead of time. But because I'm mixing it by hand with small tools, it's very important to make sure all the dry materials are evenly dispersed in the mixture before I add water. You can actually feel the difference between China clay and Nefsi. All right. Now one benefit to doing a big dry batch like this is if it's all mixed up, like I can just keep this here and use it as I need it. I mean, if I was really ambitious, I might take four of these tubs one day, mix up like four full tubs of just dry clay. Then all I gotta do from now on is to walk into my garage, mix up some V-gum, throw some dry clay in there, and I'm good. Or to make some slip or some casting slip, you know, grab a scoop of dry materials, two pounds, five pounds, whatever, and I'm good to go. Um, I can tell you that making small batches, you gotta use all the same tools and the same everything, so if you're making clay at home, big batches are better. This looks ridiculous. 20 pounds of dry materials. I can only fit 20. So avoid the urge to add water. 
This is 30% water. It should be good enough. So you can see from this piece, it actually came together quite nicely. Again, this is about 30% water. So it seems really crumbly. I've done this before, and I always add too much water thinking it's time to come together. You can hear this, listen. So even though it's crumbly, there's a lot of moisture in here. So I've done this about five times now, and I've learned something every time. 20 pounds dry is about the limit for a five gallon bucket, and it was actually difficult. The reason I started making my own clay body in the first place was that I was very used to a clay I was buying from a manufacturer, got my glazes down, got my you know shrinkage down, my colorants down, everything, and then they stopped making it. And the company actually went out of business. And so that clay no longer exists, and I had to redo everything. I told myself, you know what? I don't wanna be stuck with a specific clay that I had to figure out. Also, if you're buying clay from across the country or wherever, you're paying to ship water across the country. You know, 20% of it's water. So if you can find a recipe that works for you and the materials are pretty common, you can always make it wherever you are in the world, this state, that state, this country, that country. And it's kind of fun to make your own clay. If I want to make slip out of this clay, sometimes companies don't sell slip in the same clay body that you're using. You can always dry it out, smash it up, soak it down, and add your deflocculant or whatever for a cast and slip that way. But like you saw today, if I have this big blue bucket of dry materials, I can take some, make a batch of clay, take some more, make a batch of casting slip. So let's talk about pros and cons of mixing your own clay. We'll do the cons first. Number one, it's very messy. I'm in my garage now. I've got 10 buckets, 15 buckets on the floor, dust everywhere, my clothes are a mess. I'm glad I'm outside in the garage. If I was in my basement, it'd be a huge mess. Number two, it's very time consuming. You, know, you gotta have a lot of tools and a lot of buckets and there's a lot of processes because a big machine does it at the manufacturer. A huge plug mill mixes up probably 10,000 pounds at a time, I don't know, and they shoot it out into bags and you're done. At home, you're doing a lot of it by hand with a drill, so it's very time consuming. Number three, it's physically demanding. My back hurts, my arms will be sore tomorrow. So to summarize the cons, it's messy, it's time consuming, labor intensive. If that scares you, run away now. The pros, number one, complete control of your recipe. If you want something more white, more translucent, more plastic, stiffer, better for carving, better for throwing, you can modify it as you wish. Number two, you always have it. It's always available to you. If the company you buy from doesn't ship to where you're currently living, if you move somewhere, you're out of luck. If the company stops making the clay that you use, you're really out of luck. So wherever you go in the country or wherever you go in the world, you can make your clay body as long as you're using common materials. Everything in this video is pretty common. China clay, nepheline cyanite, silica. Nothing rare about those. Wherever I go, if I move anywhere in the country or in the world, those will be available. This clay can always be made by me. Number three, I'm calling this flexibility. So if I wanna add about 20% water, I can make clay with this for hand building, for throwing, or if I wanna make a casting slip, I can use the same dry recipe but add more water, add some deflocculant, and now I can cast with it. If I thought that I wanted to make some more sculptural pieces with, I wanted more strength, I could add 5% grog to the recipe to make it stronger. So I can modify this recipe however I see fit. That kind of goes under the complete control category, but you get the point. It allows for flexibility. Number four, this is just my personal belief. Like, I like making my own clay. I like the process. I like being connected with the materials. And then when I use it, if I mess up being more careful with, you know, how wasteful I am, it sounds really nerdy, but like it, I feel like I'm one with the clay. It's, I know, I know. But that's something that you can't replace. When I make this piece from dry powder to finished mug, finished plate, finished whatever, I was in charge of the entire process. I had a hand in every single step. Um, and that to me seems really cool. If you're not afraid of these cons, and if these pros intrigue you, I highly recommend making your own clay. Reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm not an expert, but I've done it before, and I've made a lot of mistakes that I could help you with. Very quickly, I'm gonna make a batch of blue and kind of show you the, what I would do to measure it. Just a little bit easier to mix it into a small batch first. 
doesn't get lost as easily. Yeah, this is gonna be 10% blue. And so for 20 pounds, I'm gonna add two pounds of blue mason stain to this. Okay. And then if I feel like it's a little dry from the mason stain, I'll spray some water on it. That's just from experience. Go by feel. At this point, you're probably wondering why you would do it dry instead of like liquid and put it onto a plaster slab. I mean, it's preference, but also my workspace is in the basement. It takes much longer for it to dry out. And it's harder to predict shrinkage if you don't know how much water is in your clay in the first place. So unless you soak down your slip to a exact ratio of water and then pour it out on your slab and then weigh it out after it dries to know how much water is actually in there, then you're like fighting with too soft clay, too dry clay. This way I know it's about 30% water and then I'll wedge it up together I'll let it dry, I'll weigh it again until it's at about 20% water. Because I've done it before where I mix it to like 40%, 50% water to get it slippy. And it took like days and days drying in my basement. And it was really hard to manage. So this I know is gonna be good in the bucket. Close the bucket, let it sit, wedge it up. I know it's about 30% water. So I do the same for red or black. This is 10% blue. When you add mason stains to clay, typically it dries it a little bit. And so if you're doing it with existing clay or with slip or dry clay from scratch, more water will be necessary for it to kind of soak in. It's been about two days since I made that clay. Here's the white clay. Now remember, it was really dry and crumbly, like I said, but that was 30% water, which is more than you need for clay. I kind of took my fist and pounded it down in the bucket. I spent about 10 minutes digging it out and kind of wedging it together. I did a little bit of throwing it out to a long piece, chopping it up and stacking it to make it the same consistency. But you can see from here, maybe you can't. It's still a little crumbly. That happens with your own homemade clay. It takes a while from wedging it, letting it sit for a little bit for it to be workable and usable. If you soak it down to liquid and let it dry on a plaster bat, you can use it quicker. This is really soft. You can hear, maybe you can't. This is really, really soft. So let me dig out the blue and the red. I added more water for the red, blue, and the black, but I'm guessing you didn't believe me when I said this would be good enough. I learned a new trick today. I learned a new trick today from how I stored these. Packing it down tight like that is great for letting it soak up and kind of form a block. Not great for getting it out of the bucket. So I think it would have lined this bucket with the plastic bag in order to easily kind of, you know, dump it out. The last time I did this, it was small batches. And the time before that, it was all liquid form. And that was its own disaster. So this is my first time doing it in bigger buckets or 25 pound batches. So it looks like it's really crumbly, but just watch. As I wedge this up, it's gonna come together quite nicely. You're gonna find dry pieces and soft pieces in here. And so you kind of have to make yourself a couple of wads of clay. Like here's one that I'm gonna make right here. Just kind of pack it together on all sides. This is gonna feel kind of hollow. 
Maybe you can even hear it. I feel like there's hollow space in there. It's because there is. In between every molecule of clay, there's like space and there's a gap. And over time, the moisture fills it in. And then with proper particle packing and wedging, it comes together. Tom Coleman has a website, talks about making clay from scratch. Um, I think it's Tom Coleman, I'm pretty sure. And you know, whether you make it from liquid scratch or kind of dry scratch, and he'll tell you to let it kind of add just enough water to help it kind of come together. And then let it sit for a while. Some civilizations would leave their clay in caves for, I don't know, decades, for years, for months. Let all that good bacteria kind of grow, let the moisture kind of soak in, let it coat all the silica particles, all the clay particles. I don't have 10 years, I don't know about you guys, but I bought this custom scraper. It's a Narakomi custom scraper. You can't be as aggressive with your wedging at this point because the clay wants to crumble. It's still a little bit short. So just kind of, you know, give it a couple of wedges. So after stacking slabs, throwing it out, cutting it, stacking it, you can see it's actually quite a quite nice blob right now. A little bit of wedging, I'm sure this will be fine. So again, avoid the urge to overwater it. I'll let this sit for uh, maybe another day or so. I might wedge it a little bit today to see if I can get some air bubbles out of the clay there and then let it sit for a couple days, let it really solidify, and then I'll start working with it. I added a lot more water to the red clay compared to the white, blue, or black clay. Uh, it made it easier to mix up in the first place because it was just easier to squeeze, it wasn't as crumbly, but you can tell from listening and watching, this clay is too wet to work with. I'll tell you what though, it's easier to get out of the bucket when it's wet. The black clay I also had more water to, but a little bit less than the red. Oh yeah, and it feels much better too. Maybe I didn't add more water to the black. Or tons more at least. Okay, let's get this out of here. Here we go. Now this wasn't 10% mason stain added by dry weight. This was only seven and a half because I find that black is much more powerful when it comes to stains. And 10 is kind of overkill and it saves you some money. So this is 7.5% mason stain added by weight. You can see it's really crumbly, but with a little bit of maneuvering, this is gonna wind up being super nice. Besides mixing your own clay, the most effort goes into wedging up your own clay, um, getting all the air bubbles out, making sure it's all the same consistency. And an easy way to make sure it's all the same versus wedging it over and over is making a couple of blobs, stacking them, throwing them out, cutting them, stacking them, throwing them out, and repeat. This saves you time, saves you energy, and allows multiple layers to form and even out your entire batch of clay. Something very satisfying about this bowling ball sized piece of clay. Probably about, yeah, this is about 20, 26 and a half pounds. But I know with the proper water, this should weigh about 25 pounds. And so if I were to let this dry, cut up into pieces and weigh it out, once it gets 25 pounds, I know it's the proper water consistency for me to work with. Let's get a bag. Fast forward two months from the initial mixing day and I've added a yellow clay. I'm still working on my red, blue, and black clay. I've made more white clay. And the clay is more plastic. It's come together. It's better for throwing, better for hand building. It's just what I was hoping for. And if you'll stick around just a moment longer, here's a quick compilation of the pieces I've made recently with this colored clay. I post a lot more pieces of in-progress work on my Instagram if you want to check it out. It's at Ceramic Gym. I very much enjoy the short and condensed format of Instagram. 
you know, for works in progress, for process videos. And so if you're interested in more than just Ceramic Gym on YouTube, feel free to check it out. So that's how I mix clay at home for pottery and ceramics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.